Tampa Bay Devil Rays 4, Cuban National Team 1. We'll talk about President Obama's trip to Cuba on this edition of Tune In. Hi folks, thanks for tuning in. Here's your host, Representative Rick Crawford. And we are back for another edition of Tune In. I am your host and your representative, Rick Crawford. Glad you could join us. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Cuba, the president's trip to Cuba this week, and what we're trying to accomplish with regard to Cuba trade and particularly agriculture trade. You probably saw the news videos of, of the president attending the uh, baseball game with Raul Castro. Tampa Bay, Devil, Tampa Bay Devil Rays were playing an exhibition game with the Cuban national team. Uh, not the greatest optics, particularly while he was watching the game after the Brussels attack and uh, probably you know, not very well received. Certainly there were those of us in the United States that didn't appreciate that, uh, that approach. But we are uh, you know, supportive of agricultural trade. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the current trade embargo against Cuba and what that means to, to us in the United States. And what it could mean for us in the future if we had some success in lifting that bar embargo as it applies to agricultural goods. We are in our 55th year of the trade embargo against Cuba. And that's a lot has changed in those in those decades. But embargo supporters argue that the Cuban regime's human rights violations and other transgressions uh, prove the need to retain our current posture. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees on Cuba's past record, but there are some disagreements on how we solve those problems. Um, if you recall, I had Senator Bozeman on tune in last year, and he said this about Cuba trade. Take a listen. I had the opportunity uh, when I was in the House to serve with Tom Osborne, you know, the great coach from Nebraska. Oh, yeah. And Nebraska being a very agricultural state, this was one of the things he was really passionate about. But he used to get up on the floor of the house and he'd say, look, you know, as a young coach, I learned very quickly if you ran the same play over and over and again, you didn't get anywhere. He said, we've been running this play for 40 years. And that mm -hmm. was the, the time frame when he was here. He said, we need to do something different. So I think we have to ask ourselves, who are we really punishing with the embargo? Are, are we punishing the Cuban government? Or are we punishing the Cuban people and the American businesses that want to serve the Cuban people? I think those are the questions we have to ask. Blocking trade can not only hurt U.S. consumers and exporters, especially those in Arkansas, who um, really stand to benefit greatly from lifting that, that trade embargo, particularly on agricultural goods. But it's also, um, you know, it hurts the vulnerable people in those targeted nations. Let me go back to 1972 with President Nixon in office, and he was one of the most vocal opponents of communism, and he visited the People's Republic of China, Communist China, uh, despite the many differences that we had with, with uh, China and still do, um, particularly driven by human rights violations. President Nixon was successful in opening up China after decades of, of an embargo. That visit, his visit to China changed the political world at that time and really has gone on and, and, and done quite a few things in China that, that took several decades. Keeping in mind, of course, that was 1972, and here we are you know, in 2016, so quite a lot of water under the bridge. But the relationship and, and trade that followed also transformed life for the Chinese people. They now have greater opportunities, freedoms, and access to Western ideas. Far from perfect, we will agree. And, and um, China still has uh, some hum human rights issues and political dissidents and political prisoners and so on. But uh, the results have been remarkable in, in a generation, what's been accomplished. China shifted from a society that was dominated by a murderous regime to one that where we're seeing increasing prosperity in a middle class that didn't exist before. Commercial opportunities and, and relative abundance, keeping in mind what things were like back in 1972. They continue, China continues to have um, their issues. There's no question about it. Many human rights violations, and no one's denying that. In fact, just last year I met with a woman in, in uh, Newport who owns a Chinese restaurant there, and she actually fled her home country of China based on um, religious persecution. Um, so we're not denying that China is still a human rights violator. However, there has been 
a marked change in the trajectory with China since the 1970s, while the continued sanctions imposed on other countries sometimes have the opposite effect. And we're seeing that in Cuba, where sanctions actually strengthen the regime in one way by allowing the government to blame all the problems of Cuba on the United States and the sanctions imposed by the United States. So that sets us up to be the bad guy. We're the culprits and not the repressive regime itself. And that we need to change that uh, dynamic of that relationship. With trade established between the two countries, Cubans who would, uh, would defend the Castro regime, they'd lose another reason to support it. And the defense of such a, of, of such a government would grow much more difficult and, and seemingly it would be threadbare. Uh, this week, the New York Times reported a, a key difference between an elderly Cuban man who was supportive of the revolution and his son-in-law, who explained that Cuba's rising generation has largely dismissed those ideals in favor of, say, an affordable car or a household appliance, something like that. And so we've seen a generational shift in people's attitudes toward, toward Cuba, and not just Americans, but Cuban exiles. And now that they've been here for a generation and they've got kids and even grandkids, those kids and grandkids are seeing this in a different light. So we think that trade with Cuba would encourage and empower that rising generation. That's what this is about. So in the next few weeks, in fact, in two weeks, I'll be taking a trip to Cuba myself, along with uh, Representative Ralph Abraham from Louisiana and some um, ag producers from a very important region, obviously Arkansas and Louisiana. And we're going to go and see what we can do to help foster greater relationships as it applies to uh, ag trade with Cuba, and I'm going to focus primarily on my legislation that I've talked about before, and that is the Cuba Agricultural Exports Act, which doesn't repeal the current trade embargo. What it does is opens up the market for our U.S. producers to participate, taking down some of the barriers to participating in that market, the uh, the cash up front requirement, for example. Um, and we also, uh, my bill also allows for investment in Cuban agricultural businesses, uh, with the important caveat, this is the, this is the key part of this that they can't be state-owned entities. So we're trying to identify private entities uh, in Cuba and work to to uh, develop trade relationships with those private ent uh, entities. Um, so it should be a, gr a good trip, a good fact-finding mission. We're about out of time for now, but uh, just wanted to make you aware of what was going on with. Uh, uh, U.S.-Cuba relations and, and how we can enhance um, our access to that market. As always, you can email me your thoughts uh, through our website. You can uh, hit us up on Facebook and, of course, tweet us at TuneInAR1, at TuneInAR1. As always, we ask that you give us your name and your hometown so we can properly attribute your comments. Until the next tune in, here's a look at this week's Vote Check. We'll see you next time. Thanks.